Praise God. We come before God and uh, we're gonna, we have been teaching on a series on, uh, we have been teaching on a series on stages of prayer. We touch, this is the third message in this series. We touch on desire. Last week we talked about passion and uh, today we want to talk about confidence. But that word confidence does not express fully what the Bible wants to convey to us, how that there's a stage in prayer when we come to, at first when we come into prayer, all that we have is a desire, an inclination, or maybe sometimes a need, and out of the need comes a desire to have the needs met, or a desire or aspiration to reach into something that uh, probably produced by God's Spirit within uh, our lives, driving that desire. And then we realize that the desire, uh, we might not be sure about all the details of God's will for our lives, not even a methodology, sometimes not even sure if that's God's will in our life. So we've got to pray through until we become sure, pray through, and in part of prayer, we have mentioned how passion is very important. Um, it's not sometimes knowledge that di distinguish people. Uh, in this world, we value knowledge, we value training. Uh, we send children to universities and uh, some of us, we continue to acquire knowledge to keep ourselves and doctors and uh, I don't know what other professions. They have to keep uh, every year, they have certain credits that they have to enter into to upgrade their knowledge, to keep current to the knowledge even after they are professionally qualified. And so knowledge is very important. But we all know that you could meet two or three knowledgeable doctors but one might be more passionate than another. Perhaps passionate for healing, passionate for people than the other. And uh, so in this world where knowledge has become so common, knowledge is easily available as the keyboard on your computer. One, once you're connected to the internet, one, type, one word from your keyboard, one sentence on your keyboard, and you have a vast knowledge available to you. Not all the knowledge is true, not all the knowledge is accurate, but you've got a vast amount of knowledge. And all of the encyclopedias of the world cannot contain all that's available today on the internet. In fact, uh, you could put the whole Britannica and it only be just a couple of gigabytes. You could put the whole of the atlas of the world in just a few gigabytes. And today you've got knowledge in terabytes and, and bigger than that. Uh, uh, and so much knowledge. But it's not knowledge that makes us who we are. It is part of it. It's passion. See, Paul didn't have knowledge of Jesus. He didn't know the truth. But he was passionate. And of course, passion can be dangerous when you got the wrong knowledge. He was passionate for the wrong thing. And he ended up doing the wrong thing. But when he came to know the Lord, whatever little knowledge he had immediately changed him. He became more passionate than some of the other Christians around him. And he pressed further. It was not just knowledge that made the difference. Knowledge is important. We need to acquire knowledge, which is why I believe in, in, in getting knowledge, in sending children to as high a qualification as they can go. Of course, they must be willing to do it too. And... Um, to go to universities, to go to uh, a training, or wherever that is good. Now, of course, some of the knowledge, if it's not taught properly or inaccurately, uh, or without the Bible as a base, might lead them astray. But then, they need to confront these things. They are out in the world. Knowledge is important. But as important, if not slightly more important, is passion. Passion is what makes us different. Passion is what makes uh, an entrepreneur stand out among thousands of other entrepreneurs. Passion is what makes uh, one business uh, shop that he opens stand out uh, above 10,000 other shops. Passion is what makes a church member stand out beyond a thousand or ten thousand other church members. 
passion is what makes one pastor stand out beyond 10,000 pastors or of, of, of all the fivefold ministries. Passion is what makes us stand out. And we need to have that in our life. Without passion, uh, and passion comes from love. The more you love God greatly, the more passion you have. The more you love people, the more passion you have. And the problem is not that we don't have desire. It's that our desires are divided into every area. So we need our desires consolidated by the Spirit. The problem is not that we don't have passion, but our passion is divided into so many things that it becomes weak. Our passion is like a jack of all trades and master of none. We need to gather our passion into the right module, in a, into the right direction. And the greatest passion we should have is passion for God. Love God. And when you love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength, you have a passion for people. You love people. When you keep those two commandments, you'll be passionate about everything else in life. Because they all line up under these two great loves that God has for our lives. But tonight, we have to move further than that. And that is confidence. Now, this confidence, unfortunately, I try to find an English word that can convey that. There's no English word that can translate the word parisia in the Greek. Let me point to you in the verses where it comes from. In the book of Hebrews, which talk about faith, faith is from the substance hypostasis, but we're not teaching hypostasis tonight. We're teaching something else, which is also found in the book of Hebrews. We have enough teaching on faith by now. We've been touching the gift of faith and uh, on hypostasis and the various areas of faith. But passion or, or confidence is mentioned here in chapter 3 of Hebrews. Chapter 3 of Hebrews. And in reference, of course, first to our Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the parisia, P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A, the parisia or the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So apparently we need to have this confidence or this conviction that is there. Now that's a different word confidence from the one in verse 14. Verse 14 is the word hypostasis. And should have been translated our substance in line with Hebrews 11 verse 1. And of course in my translation of the Bible it will be clear cut. The substance will be the same. Hypostasis was translated substance. And uh, in verse 14, it should have been, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our substance steadfast to the end. Doesn't matter whether people understand the verse, but when they read Hebrews 11 verse 1, they can relate it together. Consistency in Greek translation, I call it. But here in the same chapter, you got the same English word confident. And if you were non-Greek student, you check the concordant confidence, you thought it's the same thing. Different. Verse 14 is talking about the substance of faith. Verse 6 is talking about something else altogether that comes from our own life. The word parisia comes from, of course, the combination of the word para and uh, the word uh, risia uh, and the root is ergol, which is uh, more to do with a, a spoken word in which one has full confidence in. It has an oral quality to it. And in that part, there was no way you could bring it out in the English. Because in the English, confidence could be just a feeling. A feeling of assurance. And uh, a feeling of assurance is the, uh, the definition of confidence in the English. And I tried to look for an English word to convey this. I couldn't find anyone. There's no English word to convey this assurance that is based upon a spoken word or that is so great that you are not only spoken word of God, 
not just a word that is outside of you. But this, this word that is so strong in you, that you're confident so much that you could talk about it confidently. You could tell about it like it's, it's something that you have seen, like a, like a first eyewitness. Like uh, if I were to ask you, you know, uh, what does uh, wonton noodle taste like? You, if you haven't tasted it, you can't, but if you taste it, you could describe it to me. And, uh, so you could tell me confidently what you tasted, uh, what you've seen. Here, it's the confidence that is derived that affects your speech area such that you're willing to talk about it confidently uh, like it's really your life and your blood. That's the root meaning behind. And uh, that's just one of the words, uh, the two words are combined together. And uh, one of the words has to do with a, uh, something about the spoken word. Confident that you can say it out. And confidence in, in your own words. Confidence in God's word. Confidence in the word. And uh, the other is the word parao, as you know, all inclusive. So it's like the full assurance of the particular word or particular desire or particular prayer or particular uh, passion that you have. And that comes before faith starts coming. So the, the confidence part comes from us before the gift of faith arises into our life. And this is a confidence that, that he talks about how that uh, we need to hold fast this confidence and this rejoicing of the hope firm to the end until we receive the full assurance of hope. This is all the beginnings of the confidence that we must not let go. And, uh, let's look further on here in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 where the same word comes out again. Now I point out how important this confidence is in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your parousia or confidence which has, look at the words, great reward. So, wow, there's a great reward. And this is not the only place where it talks about reward. We know faith produces reward. Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek after Him diligently. So, to those who don't believe in all night prayer, to those who don't believe in fasting, to those who don't believe in prayer, to those who believe in spending time with God, Read Hebrews 11 verse 6 and ask them to look at the word diligently seek Him. Diligently seek Him. And ask them what it means to diligently seek something. Okay, if they diligently seek to succeed, what do they do? Because they take time, pay the price. If they diligently, diligently seek for a book, what do they do? They will go all over searching for the book. Now, the Bible says, diligently seek the Lord. Obviously, it involves our part. Not to say that it's by works that God accepts us, but it's that if you love God, your passion drives you to seek after God. And so here we have that there is a reward that comes out of diligently seeking Him and having faith. But here there is great reward you know why great reward? Because before faith can come is this conviction. Where it's not yet faith yet. Not yet hypostasis. But just parisia. Just that parisia, that confidence that is, uh, that is rising. You know how when we start praying about something, your mind might believe. Because after all, you, the Bible says it, you believe it, that settles it. And, and you learn that the Bible is the word of God. And uh, so there is a certain amount of wanting to believe or believing with your mind. But I have to ask you this question, right? Because uh, this prayer box has a lot of things, and uh, all of us have, might have prayer items. This simple question Do you really believe that what you pray for, you're going to receive? A lot of us don't really believe. We, we do, in a sense, tell ourselves that we believe. But you can tell in a person's actions and conversation. We are not convinced yet. 
We have not even convinced ourselves how much more you have to convince God that you have faith. That was the problem that Charles G. Finney found when he was a new Christian. Charles G. Finney, when he got born again, he was a very qualified lawyer, a very clever intellectual guy. And then you read any of his books, you realize you know, he's a very smart man. And from a, being a lawyer, he studied the word of God like any lawyer. And uh, so after he was born again, he attended a church. And then in the church, they have a regular prayer meeting. I don't know whether it's once a week or once a month, but he attended it. And then they would pray, they would, they would spend time you know, in all those uh, long prayer requests. And then at the end of it, after spending a, a few times with them, he told them, he says, he says, uh, brethren, he says, you don't really believe what you pray for. Then he said, why? He says, because you don't believe that God hurt you. Because after your prayer, you talk as if he hasn't hurt you. He hasn't hurt one prayer. And you speak in complete unbelief. He says, we can keep doing this. And the more we do this, the more in unbelief we, be, we enter into. Now don't forget, at that time, revival hasn't broken out yet. But he's teaching people to really learn to believe. And that's when, as he began to talk more in this area, people began to get convicted and they realized they don't really believe what they pray for. Think about the things you're praying for. Do you actually believe it? And we, in our mind, we, we think we do. But there's still a lot of doubts running all over the place. That's why I call stages of prayer. Because it's all right, don't panic, it's normal. We humans were once upon a time born in sin. And our old man that was crucified still make echoes and noises. And some of the things we pray for, instinctively we fear and we un have unbelief before we believe. And that's a process. Where as you learn to come before God and pray and you examine yourself, examine yourself and learn that there is a stage where before faith comes, you become more and more confident and more and more convicted that what you pray, say convicted of what? That God heard you. That God heard you. That God heard your prayer. That God is moving in your prayer. That God is answering the prayer. You reach a stage when you know that He is he's hearing your prayer. You might not see the answer yet. You might not feel the answer yet. But your heart has come to be more settled. And Neither are you rushing for the answer. Neither are you saying, right, tomorrow is going to happen. We're not saying that. But there's a quiet confidence that comes into your heart that you know, ah, God has heard me. And that doesn't mean that you might not pray that again as long as you didn't see the answer. You might come and say, God, you know, I thank you. And I'm just confessing and proclaiming because you know, I'm just bringing it before you. Until it manifests, I'm going to keep praying over it and you can pray in tongues and all those things. But there's something in you comes a sense that God has heard you. And that is something inside us, not in our head, in our heart. Something deep inside where, if I can put it in a negative way, the doubts disappear. The dust disappear. Where before you used to wonder whether oh, you could be praying for salvation for your loved ones or whatever, but take that as an example. And you every time see how they believe, you say, oh, I don't know how they're going to be saved. And uh, you wonder how, how God's going to answer. And, and, and the more you pray, the more they seem further away. And you're wondering, it's getting worse. And uh, So those things used to cause you trouble. Those things caused to, cause, cause you panic. Those things... Cause, seem to cause you discouragement. 
But then you reach a point where everything hasn't changed outside yet. But inside there's a quiet confidence that say, I, I know I know God's gonna answer. And not only is the quiet confidence inside, it begins to affect your speech. Every time that situation confront you, you keep saying, I know it's gonna change. And you didn't just say it just to make confession. You say it because it's coming from some deep part of you that has a quiet confidence. See, it's changing your speech. By that quiet confidence, parisia involves the changing of your speech. It involves your idle words also changing. Where ideally, you know, sometimes you know people professionally confess God's words or in devotional confess God's words. And then in between the time, they, they, uh, when they didn't confess God's words, they confess all their negative things. And it just doesn't work that way because it's not in their heart yet. But this parisia is very important. It builds us into what I call, for lack of a better English word, confidence. But it's confidence of the heart, confidence that affects your thinking, confidence that affects your speech, confidence that affects your action, confidence that you begin to prepare the way for the answer, confidence that you begin to look for the answer, confidence that is building. And it's just one tiny step away from who starts his faith starting in your life. But that confidence has been built up. Now let's look at that confidence again, and this time in the book of First John. First John said it several times. First in First John chapter two. First John chapter two. And the particular verse that we are looking over here, on uh, First John two, verse twenty eight, says, "And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have parisia or confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming." So here he's talking about building the confidence uh, as we abide in him build his confidence. Then you go to chapter 3. In chapter 3, it says here, looking at uh, verse, uh, let's start from verse 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Then verse 21 is interesting. And that's where the word parisia comes. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. We have parisia towards God. That tells me something about how the confidence can come. You reach a stage where your heart doesn't condemn you anymore. You reach a stage where your heart agrees 100% with you. Now, it says that if your heart condemn you, don't worry. It did say the verses before. It says, keep, keep growing into God. And there is a stage where when you're praying, your heart condemns you. You see, how can the heart condemn you? Where does the condemnation come from? Hold your place in 1 John chapter 3 and look over at the book of Hebrews. Hebrews again. And the passage of Hebrews that we're interested in is chapter 10 of Hebrews. And, and don't forget, chapter 10, verse 35 is where we had that verse, uh, Therefore, do not cast away your parisia, which has great reward. Now, if you have a word, therefore, it tells you that the preceding verses and argument are important to that sentence. And the preceding argument starts way back he had a lot of therefores inside. But it starts from verse 19. It says, therefore, and after talking about Jesus, he talks about in verse 19, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we have been with the blood of Jesus, which all of us have in the New Testament. We can enter freely by the blood of Jesus. We know that. We believe that to a certain extent. But even though you believe that, 
It says in verse 20, and we all know verse 20, by a new and living way which he, he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, uh, and having a high priest over the house of God, we, we draw near. But look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Says, what, what is he talking about? And I have asked many Christians who have not got much teaching, I said, what do you think this verse is talking about? Now, let's take the simple one first. What does it mean by the bodies washed with pure water? Is it a cleansing ceremony? Is it water baptism? Now, if it is water baptism, then we are forbidden from bap being baptized in the sea because sea is not pure water, salt water. Or oh, the Jordan River actually is not as clean as we think. And uh, he has, you know, quite a lot of things. It's not really pure water. So, he's speaking here in analogy. When he's talking about our bodies washed with pure water, there was a time in the Old Testament. Remember, the book of Hebrews is filled with allegories. In, you got to examine, and it, the book of Hebrews was written from a Jewish perspective. A lot of Jewish ceremonies are mentioned, including the, the, all the uh, parts of the furniture in the tabernacle. In the Jewish tradition, way back from Moses' time, there was a time before the high priest can be qualified the high priest. Many of us forgot that actually Moses bathed Aaron. Wow, Aaron cannot take a bath by himself. Part of ceremony. Now, in case I know you're holding, I always say hold your Bible there, hold your Bible here. So unfortunately, you've got to hold your Bible at 1 John, hold your Bible at Hebrews 10. And, since you've got many fingers, uh, take a glimpse into Leviticus. Before Aaron could be the high priest, before Aaron could be the high priest, it tells us here in the book of uh, Leviticus, in chapter 8, Verse 6. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. You see that? That one sentence might have taken a long time if Aaron was dirty. And uh, he actually washed, Aaron didn't wash himself. Moses washed him with cloth or scrub or pour pure water. Wash him. Every single part because Aaron was now to be consecrated as a priest. And you might say, why wash him? This is Old Testament, remember. Don't try this at home in the New Testament or you know, or try this in your, your, your fellowship or whatever. It doesn't apply to the New Testament. It's Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, the priest must not have any blemish. By blemish, not simple, simple, real blemish, but really scars or deformities. And every single part cannot have blemish. That's the old, old covenant. It was symbolic of purity. And uh, any part, uh, even if they are firstborn or they are a Levite or they are of the house of Aaron, if they have some parts of their body uh, in deformity, God didn't allow them to serve. Now, God was not against anyone who was born deformed. It happened to be a symbol he must preserve as a message to the New Testament. In the New Testament, God doesn't care. You can be whatever uh, genetic in informity, you can go right into the Holy of Holies. God doesn't care because it's all done. But Old Testament, he has to cloth his message and quote his message. And so the reason why Aaron has to be washed publicly is so that every part of it is examined. He washed in pure water. 
So it has to be a careful washing. And if it didn't qualify, a base. Right? And then be the one of the only times you got a younger brother wash the older brother and the older brother's son. But to the Jews, I mean, these are all part of it. I mean, some of you have been in the army, right? Some of you have been, right? In the army, I mean, nudity and all this is nothing. You know, they just strip and all bathe in one shot together. And uh, it's, uh, and so in, in that time, they understood those things. They understood this is part of a ceremony. And so they would, uh, they would uh, after washing with pure water, then only you can cloth him. Cloth him with the holy garments. And after clothing, uh, putting cloth on him and his son, because the son is going to serve with him as assistant to the high priest, then he anoint them. And after they're all ready, then in the next chapter, they can serve God. It was very intricate. Understanding that process, we go back to Hebrews. Wash with pure water. The whole idea was talking about the purity of the priesthood. And that wash with pure water thing, the water rep always represent, water can represent two things, either spirit or word. And sometimes it talks about spirit. Sometimes it talks about word. And uh, so, uh, in this particular case, you can apply it to both, but we all know one thing. In the New Testament, the cleansing is by the Word. And so you can let go of the one in Leviticus, keep holding 1 John and Hebrews 10, and look over at the book of Ephesians, and see this apply as to the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, where Christ is the bridegroom, church is the bride, and he presents it here in verse 26, 27. He says, Husbands love your wife just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it. Verse 26, Ephesians 5, 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And here's the part where spiritually you will not have spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. She shall be holy and without blemish. That is the fulfillment of the Old Testament typology. With that in mind, when you look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, very carefully again, when he says our bodies wash it pure water, he's talking about sanctified in our body. The word sanctifies us. So we are consecrated to the Word. Now, who was Jesus? Jesus was the Word made flesh. So Jesus was already sanctified. But we, and where is sin nature? Sin nature is in our physical body. That is why we need to continually meditate on the Word until the Word become flesh to us. <coughs> the good thing that the Bible declares in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. But it didn't stop there. The next phrase after that tells us that <coughs> it enters into our marrow and our bones. Marrow and bones uh, into our marrow tells us this, that we might not realize it. The Word of God, the reading of the Word, the meditation of the Word affects your physical body. Scientists have not quantified it yet, but I hope one day the science will be able to measure these things. We know that in John G. Lake's ministry, he did demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit tangibly when he confronted germs and bacteria. As he put it under the microscope, the bubonic plague died under the microscope. I believe, based on Hebrews 4 verse 12, also Proverbs 3 has that, where the word becomes flesh. But let's take the New Testament, Hebrews 4 12, that the word affects something inside our spirit and our soul. Now if it can affect so deep, why can't we believe that the word also affects your physical body? 
Some of you might have started experiencing that when you meditate on the Word of God for more than an hour. You could sense something different. It has affected you in some way. And uh, uh, scientists have not yet quantified it. But one thing we know, your emotions produce chemicals which affect your body. So if your soul, where your emotional seed lies, can affect your physical body through chemicals, why can't we believe that your spirit can affect you in some way, chemically, that your body changes and is transformed and healing flow for. And let me make it easier for you to believe also. You believe in laying hands on the sick and they recover. If sickness, there can be sickness caused by demonic area and that is spiritual. They can be cast out. But sickness are also caused directly from the physical. So if you lay hands on the sick, and whether it be cholera, chicken pox, or some sickness, and for healing to take place, doesn't it mean that the spiritual has to be converted into natural too? That every single sick cell in your body has to be revived and receive something? So if you believe in healing, in divine healing, you actually believe in transmutation between spiritual matter into physical matter. Because spiritual matter must transfer into, into physical matter to affect the actual physical cells that could be sick. It could be cancerous and the cancer dies and the, and the new cells that are created are cancer free. So if you believe in divine healing, then you will actually be believing in a transmutation of spiritual substance into physical substance that affects your physical cells and atoms and molecules. If you believe in the feeding of the 5,000 uh, with 5 loaves and 2 fishes, you believe that to prayer, there is a transmutation of at the molecular structure of the bread that caused the bread to keep multiplying until there was more bread left over than the original starting. So there's a transmutation of spiritual into creation of something in the physical. And that is your default mode if you believe Bible. So with that default mode, why should we not believe that the Word of God, where Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life, Zoe life, that the word and Hebrews 4 12 says, uh, Jesus said the same in John 6 63. And Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, The word is alive. The first phrase is, The word is living. And the word living is Zoe life. And we know that Zoe life is more powerful than Bios life and Suke life because it affects both. Why can't we believe that every time you take the word? Something happens to your cells much better than taking an aspirin or a Panadol. Right? When you take an aspirin or Panadol or cough syrup, you believe that chemically it adds something to your body. Why can't we believe that when you read the word and meditate on your word, that something chemically affects you at the same time affecting your spirit? It should be easy, not just, not just a leap of faith, easy uh, step, just one step. You believe in divine health and healing. And what we are saying is this that the word does have a sanctifying effect on sin nature in your body. Let's take it several more steps. We know there was one person in the Old Testament called Enoch where the Bible said Enoch walked with God and he was not. Now we know that means that he was also taken physically. That means his physical body was translated. If that is so, that something must have happened to all the cells in his body. Now we know in Moses' story 
that Moses' skin cells were shining with light, brighter than the light bulbs that we have. So we know that the glory of God can have an effect on the cells in your physical body. Moses' face became luminescent. So bright that you're like looking into a light bulb when you look at his face. And Moses has to cover his face. And we are talking about Old Testament. It was a natural phenomenon. So you could imagine that if what affected Moses was taken one step further, the cells permanently change until they are resurrected cells and never die again. Which I believe is what happened to Enoch. He walked with God in God's presence that he was not. He was changed completely. How do you think the church in the last days will be translated in a rapture? What is it that Paul was talking about the mystery when he talked about the manifestations of the sons of God? Was it just the spiritual manifestation? If you read Romans chapter 8 very carefully, it was physical. You say, wow, yes. Sorry, sorry again. Hold your place in First John, which you haven't left. Hold your place in Hebrews 10. And you can let go of Ephesians 5 now and look at Romans 8. <coughs> Romans chapter 8 for a moment. In Romans 8, verse 23, wasn't he talking about the physical body? Physical body. It says there, and don't forget, this is Romans 8. Romans 7, he says, sin lives in the body, in the flesh. Now in Romans 8, he says in verse 23, Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. The body. And even when he started this whole topic, he was talking in verse 11 about the life of God in our mortal body. As if he's afraid we will misinterpret, he says, our mortal body. In verse 11. Then he continues to talk about how we live in the spirit and not in the flesh. And we're heirs of God. And then he says in verse 18, this glory one day will be revealed in us not just to us in us reveal to us means we see it reveal in us means we become it we become it the glory becomes us and transmuted into us for the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the revealing of the sons of god then he talked about physical creation this creation was subject to futility and creation itself is waiting for the glorious liberty. And it says in verse 22, the whole creation groans and labor. And then it says in verse 23, we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption of the, the sonship, the redemption of our body. The whole purpose is the, if I can use this word, the transformation and physical transmutation of the physical body and I believe if you can have one Enoch in the Old Testament you can have many in the New if you understand how to walk in His presence of God and you walk with God until the presence change you it might cause your skin to shine first halfway there, Moses stage. Because Moses still died. But Moses got, his body got taken early. Why? Because that body has been touched by the glory of God. But you bring the glory to another stage, 
it actually resurrects every cell so that the cell become for mortal cells it become immortalized filled with the glory of God and the, and the sin nature is driven out of every single cell in your body until we become the word made flesh Jesus was the word made flesh we, the church of Jesus Christ, become the Word made flesh. So he's talking about this possibility that is there. And uh, that is why in Hebrews chapter 10, now finally we finish Hebrews 10, verse 22, when they talk about our bodies wash, sanctified with this physical uh, wash with water I believe he's talking about the sanctification process because sanctification if you study in the Bible is past tense present tense and future tense it's found in all three tenses and so sometimes people argue about sanctification in Bible school we used to talk about doctrines of sanctification and all that and they don't define it properly but if you read every single verse, every single verb, and every single noun with the word sanctification, which is uh, from the word hagios basically, you'll find it referred to past tense, sanctification done in Christ, future tense, and present tense. And you know why? Past tense because sanctification has been done in your spirit. Present tense because your soul is in the process of being saved. In the book of First Peter, Second Peter, it talks about the soul as being continually saved. You say, hey, I thought my soul is saved. It is the process of salvation, purifying, sanctifying under our soul, no longer as sin nature. And it says about our body, one day the body will finally be sanctified when it's transformed into a resurrection body. So sanctification is past tense, present tense, future tense. Future tense for most of us means Jesus' second coming. The good news for you here is that even before he comes, you can have a measure of the sanctification process. And we pray that who knows perhaps in the New Testament where people who walk with God and transmuted. If they go one, e one Enoch in the Bible, at least recorded, one Elijah who never saw death, who knows in the New Testament, you can have more people who have the word become flesh and they got transformed and translated even before their time. And that's, I believe, a possibility. That is what Hebrews 11 verse 22 point to. Our bodies sanctified by the word of God. Now, look at the middle part. The heart's Sprinkle from an evil conscience. We know sprinkle refer to the blood of Jesus. And the conscience lies somewhere on your inside. So isn't it funny that you have to draw near to God. Here you're praying, you've got desire to pray to God. You have passion, you pray to God. But somehow your heart cannot have confidence. You know why? Because somewhere on the inside, a little, little, little things, little corners, a little rooms in the heart. In the physical heart, only four chambers. But in the, in the, in the soul heart, we've got many, many chambers where we hide different things. Things dark in our secret paths. Things dark in our secret places. And God knows every corner. And sometimes we say we desire something, but your desire could be 10% good motive, 20% okay motive, and then 70% uh, selfish motive. How will you know? Nothing wrong with your prayers being answered. But if we want to be honest with ourselves, sometimes our motivation is not 100% all altruistic or philanthropic. And... Uh, how do we deal with those things? Because by nature, we are self-preserving, self-centered people. Something has to change. And it starts in the heart. Where God cleanses the heart, 
and causes the heart and all the evil dead works to be removed. All the things that got slowly cleansing, the blood of Jesus entering deeper and deeper, finding every corner in our heart, every room in our life, until every single atom in our heart is saying, Jesus is Lord. Jesus may be Savior, but He's not Lord. Until every room in our heart cries, Jesus is the Lord in the room. That's when our heart doesn't condemn us anymore. Because our heart is Jesus. The Bible says He gave us a new heart. But we know from the book of Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 that our heart is still having the word written inside. Just like our mind. So if you look at Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, it looks like both our heart and our mind are being renewed. And usually, the renewal finishes in the heart first before it finishes in the mind. It must finish in the heart, then it finishes in the mind. Then it starts the process again. Another area in the heart, then an area in the mind. Because the heart controls the mind. The mind is just an end. The mind is important too. The mind opens it so that the heart can be dealt with. And... Uh, the heart is more like an inner chamber in your room. So sometimes, you know, in your house or in your apartments, you might have many rooms. And some of your room could be an inner room. So you've got a room that is directly facing the window, and then another room that's inside that doesn't have a window. So what do you do when you want bright light? You have to first open the outer window, then let all the light in and open all the doors to the other room, then the light goes straight into the other room. And so the mind has to be open for the heart to actually be renewed. The heart is in the inner chamber. And uh, that is why in uh, 1 John, now we can go back to 1 John, where it says in verse 20, if our heart condemns us, don't worry. So what happens if you're at stage verse 20? You have desire, you have passion, but you still don't have parisia or the confidence yet. You can't really say you have great confidence because once in a while, some parts of your heart come in and say, hey, why is my heart behaving this direction? Something is pulling it in a different direction. And sometimes we think that, that it's all 100% there, but you might find that God opens the light a bit more and you say, ah, there's still more more dust. It is just like you're sweeping the floor in very dim light. Then you thought the floor was clean. And then they sh suddenly a brighter light came. You say, oh, it's still dirty. And it sweeps a bit more. And you thought that it was very clean. And then they turn on a more powerful light. Then you say, oh, it's even dirtier than I thought. And then uh, until the, the brightest light that God could turn on and there's nothing else in that portion of the heart then your heart doesn't condemn you. In the particular area, in the particular desire that you're praying about, it says in verse 21, if our heart does not condemn us, we have parisia towards God. And because we've got so many areas of our heart, I believe that it, that can be applied to different, 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 different areas. So sometimes you've got one area where you could pray and it just goes straight through. You get confidence. But in another area, you're still developing confidence. So there are so many desires in each one of our hearts. So many things we want to achieve in life. So many things we want to get done. So many prayers. You know, when we say, you know, write down your prayers, very few people just write one and then put it in. Because life was so many things. So many desires. And then with each of the desire, you know, you might not have parisia or confidence in every one of them. But it's important to know that in whatever area you're praying about, when you have achieved parisia or confidence, that you are very close to being stabilized. And you know you reach that stage when the peace of God garrison your heart and your mind in the particular area. Whatever you see happening to the opposite of what you pray for doesn't trouble you anymore. Where it troubled you before, something in you still not steady yet. But where it doesn't shake you anymore, 
you got a very inner quiet confidence in what you're praying for. It's time for great reward. The great rewards. Because in verse 22 it says, whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Imagine, whatever you ask. And there's one more place in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. It uses the word parisia again. It says, it was 14. Now, this is the confidence, the parisia, that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. In other words, you know His will. Parisia is, you're now very sure what His will is. You notice the part where it says His will. See, sometimes when you pray about something, when I talk about His will, the Bible reveals the general will of God. But how do you know whether He wants you to be a doctor, and an engineer, a businessman? How do you know even if you're a business person to do that business or that business or the other business? How do you know, uh, even if you're an engineer, what type of engineering you want to do? How do you know you want to be a lawyer? What type of lawyer he wants you to be? See, there are so many defined choices. But what happens is, as you pray and pray and pray, the parisia grows and grows, become more purified. And at first, God might speak one time, and you thought you hear Him, it produced some sort of confidence in you. And then God keeps speaking, and, you, and you're hearing, and you seem to hear on your inside. By the time parisia comes, you're very confident that it's God's will for your life. You might not have scripture and verse because there's no scripture and verse that say does goes uh, does says a lot go to O R U or go to uh, T B N or go to whatever university. But you know, it is God's will. It is now it has now gripped you. It was a process, and sometimes you don't you can't even tell the process. Just like you can't tell when uh, when your when when your your hair is growing longer and longer. But it does. Because you still need to cut it every month. When did it grow? You don't notice it. It just grew. And uh, the same way, Parisia was growing inside you, that confidence. And at some stage, it grew to the level where you know, you know this is what God wants you to do. At first, it grew to the point where you, you think that this is what God wants you to do. But that's not enough. You spend more time with God and you pray and pray then you reach a point where you sense it's God's will for you to do. Then still not enough. You pray, pray, pray until one day you say, I know this is what God wants me to do. And then still not enough because people challenge you and you get, you get shaky. Then you pray some more and say, you definitely know that this is what God wants you to do. And then not good enough. Then you challenge and you get shaky. You reach a stage where you know that this is God's master plan and predestination plan for you. You live and die by that. Then you know it's God's will. You're very close to the answer. Great reward coming to you. The parisia has developed. It's confident. So, stages of prayer. That's why I call it stages of prayer. And uh, there's a stage when more desire than anything. There's a stage when your passion flows forth. And then there's a stage when Parisia develops confidence. And about those things that that you have come to this time in your life, certain things you're confident about. You're confident that you heard God, that you know God and know God's will in the area. That's good. Because you have passed one more stage in prayer. So as you come before God even tonight and spend time with Him, Let's understand that in some areas, you're still developing in your desire. In some areas, you're still developing your passion. In some areas, you develop your desire, your passion, and your confidence in God. And in some areas, you know you're heard from God. 
God helps us in the process. Sometimes He gives you dreams, He gives you vision, sometimes He gives you prophecies, sometimes He gives you uh, inner leading, sometimes He guides you by your peace, and sometimes He guides you by circumstances. He seems to lead in that direction. And uh, you're flowing with the best that you know how, but on your inside, confidence is developing. And the most important as we understand this is that without parisia or the confidence, you can't actually move forward. It is one of the stages that you got to pass through. You got to pass through. It's just like um, um, if you travel by land and you want to go to Thailand, the only way you can go from here to Thailand by land is to pass through Malaysia. You got no choice. So in the same way, it's just like uh, in order to get into the place where God wants to uh, answer your prayer, you got to pass through desire, you pass through passion, you pass through parisia, then you start your faith hypostasis, and God starts building the inner structure in your life, more and more detail. And it's just part of the stages of prayer that we learn to flow in as we grow in God. Praise God. Let's all rise together and... Uh, Prepare ourselves to pray in the Spirit and be guided. Remember throughout the whole year this year, we encourage you to meditate on the Word. Take those scriptures that mean a lot to your life and meditate them, pray over them until they become flesh to you. The Word becomes flesh to you. The Word becomes physical chemicals to your life. The Word becomes a part of your life. Whatever God has spoken, like He's spoken to Timothy and He says, meditate on those things. He talked about those things that God spoke into His life. He said, meditate on those things. Uh, words with the presbytery has spoken to Him. To meditate until they become flesh to His life. Praise God. Let's worship God and then we enter the prayer in the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. In the presence of a holy God, I bow down and I adore. You reveal the secrets of my heart, and I'm shaken. To the call in the presence of a holy God, there's new meaning down to grace. You took all my sins upon yourselves. And I can only stand amazed I cry, holy, holy, holy God How awesome is your name Holy God, how majestic is your reign, and I am changed in the presence of a holy God. I cry, holy, holy, holy God, how awesome is your name, holy, holy, holy God, how majestic is your reign I am changed in the presence of a holy 
Ibiriyanala mahasanala 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 mah